great everyone to get you here on this uh, bit too windy, but we're feeling a bit of spring already outside uh, in this, uh, in this uh, funny weather here in Amsterdam. Uh, but I'm glad we got all together here, and I think that's also, of course, because we got uh, important topics to discuss, where we talk about, uh, not just about fintech, which is, I think, close to our heart in a lot of cases, but actually about what kind of impact we can make with technology in, and uh, with uh, the work that the financial industry does. So I'm really happy that we got that on the agenda today and that you're all enthusiastic about that. And what we're trying to do is actually entertain you a little bit and at the same time enlighten you, share some new ideas and hopefully inspire you a bit to as well uh, uh, do better, make more impact and collaborate potentially on that level. So uh, my name is Dol Gintel, for I see a few uh, unfamiliar faces and some familiar, so that's always nice to, we, uh, to see uh, you come back as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, really look forward to taking you through the program today uh, and try to keep my input down as, uh, as much as possible and give the floor to our great speakers that we have today. Some of them you already see here on the screen, but I'll go to our agenda to take you through a little bit. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about why we do this and how we uh, want to uh, hope to hopefully inspire you. Then we'll get uh, Pelin who will talk about, uh, from AWS, to talk about uh, uh, how AWS is looking at, uh, especially the diversity and inclusion side uh, and equity side. Um, then we're going to hear from Rainbow Bank uh, by Hort, uh, who's going to talk to about uh, the Rainbow Bank perspective on, on impact. Then we're going to get a pitch from Carla uh, about Kindly. Uh, then I'll share a little bit about what we, what we last year did, always did on a monthly basis. We now actually take a whole quarter to review a little bit about the developments in FinTech. I'll try to keep it brief. I'll not take a whole quarter to enlighten, uh, enlighten you on that. Uh, and later on, we're going to do a little pub quiz uh, uh, with Kahoot to actually see how much it stuck with you. Also, to just make a bit of fun, put in a, bring in a bit of competition here. Um, after that, we're going to still have a uh, pitch from uh, Joris uh, from InveraID, who's going to do a demo uh, about their product. I think it's really interesting as well. And then we're going to see Alexandrov, uh, uh, Ivan, sorry, Ivan Alexandrov from Afape. So I look forward to also sharing that with you. At the end of the session, we'll share some more ideas about upcoming events, but we'll also like to hear from you, not just what you thought about the event as such, how we organized it, but also who you thought it did well on the uh, pitching side. So after each presentation, you'll get an uh, option to scan a QR code and review the presentation. Please give us an input, because it also makes it a little bit of fun. We'd like to bring in a little bit of competition, not about what you do, but how you bring it. Uh, and uh, especially also, I think it's nice for us to get a bit of feedback on how we can do better. So, look forward to hearing from you on that. Of course, also, there's a possibility afterwards when we go to drinks to meet us after, uh, there and give suggestions, ideas, and feedback uh, uh, live to our team. Um, am I forgetting anything, Shelly? Are we all good? Okay. Then, uh, just a very brief introduction why we're doing this. So, Holland Fintech is an association. Uh, it's, uh, uh, we have been operating now for about 10 years under the brand Holland Fintech, but actually the association was only set up three years ago. Uh, and we've established a board and uh, biannual uh, general assemblies to actually have our members have a say in how we operate our program, where we spend the budget that we have, and so on. And so the only income that we have is actually from members, and the members are companies in the Fintech space, which could be startups, their scale-ups, but we also see government financial institutions, tech parties, as well as some advisory parties that are all included in this one ecosystem, because our vision is that you actually need to get together with all diversity of the whole ecosystem to understand the challenges, developments, and the opportunities that there are in the market so you could collaborate on that. Uh, it also helps us to actually set a, a, a single voice to the outside world, which we see that especially in, for example, the political climate in the Netherlands, which is not that tech interested, I would say, uh, it's quite important as well to draw together and figure out, okay, what is actually a way to get to the minds of parliamentarians and policymakers to help them understand the importance of tech and how they could facilitate it or also make use of the tools that are available to all of us. Um, so that's what we do. We think it's also really important to make sure that the inner dynamics of the ecosystem work well. So that's why we try to look and support everyone to find talent, to find capital, and to find, of course, potentially collaboration in any kind of way that you can. Because there are so many solutions around, I always try to think of FinTech as a really big toolbox of digital Lego. Uh, and I want everyone to build one, right? So I think we should give everyone access to it, to you know, plug and play with all the different tools that there are and experiment with that. And hopefully also the presentation today will inspire you a bit about the possibilities and potential collaboration at that level. I'll leave it at that. 
Um, and I'd like to give Pelin the floor. Let's first of all thank very much uh, AWS for hosting us. Let's give him a warm uh, applause. Welcome to AMS 13, uh, AWS, uh, yeah, it's coming. Uh, AWS uh, Amsterdam office. So we are super happy uh, to actually welcome you. Um, all the faces are new to me, so that's perfect. Um, today I will be talking about inclusion, diversity and equity and how we do it in AWS. So let me start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Philip. Uh, I am originally from Turkey, uh, came here 14 years ago as an expat, and I met my husband, uh, Dutch, uh, hands tight, now I'm here with two kids, super happy. Um, next to my corporate life, I'm also a yoga teacher, giving yoga lessons in Harlem. Um, so this is the heart nurturing part uh, of my life, I would say. And you can see all the logos of the banks. So actually, I have 18 years of banking background. And before I hit 40, now you know my age almost, uh, I said I will get out of the sector and just explore something else. And I am now in AWS for one and a half years, exploring and learning every day like day one. Um, so my role in AWS is customer solutions manager, uh, which uh, means that I am actually helping enterprises uh, in the Netherlands and actually sometimes globally, uh, to have them a smooth, happy, and uh, just a satisfactory cloud journey. And next to my solutions uh, manager's role, I am also uh, the IDE lead for Benelux. So actually this is the reason that I am here today for you. I hope you get inspired. Uh, so the agenda is talking about ID&E and uh, how we do it in AWS ID&E and the affinity groups. This is actually underrepresented groups and we will wrap it up. Um, I would like to kick it off with Jeff Bezos' quote here. So every Amazonian should feel comfortable sharing their unique perspectives and every Amazonian should seek out the perspectives of others. We want our employees and the communities where we operate to embrace that we are all human, we are all different, and we are all equal. Having said that, I am going to the next slide to show you a very short video of the Director of Inclusion, Diversity and Equity, both in Amazon and AWS. And this was actually shown during the reinvent in Las Vegas in 2023, November. Let's have a look, yes. Innovation is at the core of everything we do at AWS, and inclusion can propel innovation. By embracing differences and seeking new ways of thinking, we can open doors to safe spaces of acceptance and belonging. We can attract and retain people from diverse backgrounds who can thrive. Because if culture is truly inclusive, then everyone should feel comfortable bringing their whole selves to work, making it possible for equitable outcomes. Imagine what we'll do if inclusion is the foundation of how we innovate at AWS. Join us on our journey to build a more inclusive and equitable world. So as you can see, and uh, from Jeff Bezos and also Ladavia, the, the Global Director uh, uh, in Inclusion, Diversity and Equity, ID&E is really in the DNA of this company and we really do our best every day to boost it in many perspectives. Globally, it's sometimes hard to do, to do the connections, but every country itself is doing their best to make this happen. Um, so let me dive into some data. Um, in AWS, what we always say is that we still have to do a lot. Given the fact that we are at a certain level now, comparing with the other organizations, we still say that we are not there and we have to do a lot. Uh, we have to do a lot to ensure that the identities and different perspectives are valued within the organization. We want to make sure that people are empowered and people are actually also have that ownership that they can execute themselves. 
So, but we think that this is the right thing to do, but on the other hand, it's also the smartest thing to do because when you look at the inclusive-centric organizations, the key driver there is really um, 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 the inclusive centricity to make them long-term having success and also the impact in the market. So, 80% of the uh, 2,000 um, organizations are surveyed by the Enterprise Strategy Group um, in an AWS-funded research study said that ide strategies have a very, very impactful result that there is, there is a big Im impact on the customers, on the employees, and also on the agility part. So it's not just in one part uh, of the organization, it's not just impacting on the employees, but also impacting on the, uh, on the customer level. So actually working intentionally to en enhance company inclusivity uh, helps you on the time to market, for instance, and greater market uh, share growth, achievement of revenue goals, and also greater representation among employees. Looking at the other figure, uh, leading organizations were 2.6 times more likely to beat revenue expectations by over 10%, and early stage organizations were 2.2 times more likely to miss or just to meet the revenue expectations. So, talking about a lot about inclusion, diversity, and equity, let's look at the terms. What do they mean actually? Because they are quite different from each other. So inclusion is about belonging. So it's like meant to give everyone the right tools, mechanisms, and the psychological safety to voice their thoughts. <clears throat> Diversity is being represented. So you have a safe space as a community. Equity is about fairness. It's having the equal starting points. It's establishing mechanisms and processes that in the end make all inclusion and diversity initiatives long-term sustainable. When I talk with my colleagues or with my friends, I say equity and they most of the time tell me, are you mixing up equity and equality? No, because they are two different stuff. So equality, everyone will get the exact same treatment exact same treatment while bringing their authentic selves to work. Equity is organizations and the structures are making opportunities available for everybody in order to create equal starting points. Now, a picture is coming up. Please have a look at the angle of the tree and the number of the apples on the right and the left side of the tree and the height of the ladder instead of uh, getting stuck with, with the inequity, equity. Don't look at the wording, just look at the four different pictures. So anyone resonates anything within the organization about inequity, inequality? I see nodding ahead, so that's good. So to be honest, before I take the role of IDNE, I didn't know the meaning of equity that is related to IDNE. I always saw equity is something financial markets, equity, you know, but there is a very meaningful link that you can make with IDNE. Let's talk about how we do it in AWS. So in AWS, IDNE is anchored in three different pillars. First, it's building inclusion. <coughs> Second, it's growing diverse talents. And third is driving equity. I will deep dive on the building and inclusion because if I deep dive all, I will be talking till the end of this event that you don't want. Um, so building inclusion is for us in three different layers. The first layer is on employee level, the other layer is the communities, and the other layer is the customers. If we dive into the employee part, we have different mechanisms and tools that are supporting us to boost the building inclusion part. For instance, we have inclusion pledge. This is a mechanism. Mechanism, you can take it like processes that actually help people to execute stuff. And we have an inclusion ambassadors program, which is 
related to IDNA activities. In every country, we have inclusion ambassadors. These people are having a link to IDNA and driving local community activities. And we have, next to all these, 13 affinity groups. 13 affinity groups, meaning underrepresented groups. Let's have a look at it. So, so it's not to make it too complicated for you. And so globally, we have 13 different affinity groups or underrepresented group, groups. So this group of people are not paid for these affinity groups. They have a passion, they have a drive, and they come together, they create a chapter, and they are running after a mission. And we have inclusion ambassadors program in every country. Think that the inclusion ambassador program is like a, it's an umbrella. And underneath the, this umbrella, you have different affinity groups. So what we do, for instance, in the Netherlands, uh, women at Amazon, Glamazon for LGBT, and people with, uh, with disabilities are very, very active. And all these affinity groups have their own roadmaps. What we do is to get together, together with the IDNE from Amazon plus AWS, we talk about our roadmaps and how we can help with each other instead of creating different silos and different group of people who are actually doing their own small thing. Because we want to bring that big impact to our employees, customers, and the communities. So in the end, all these goals are contributing to the global uh, goals and missions and the vision of IDNE. To wrap it up, at AWS we know that our innovations would not be uh, possible without diverse teams because diverse teams are thinking big, they are thinking di differently, they are thinking uh, and acting differently, and actually these people are making, the creating our products and services that we offer to our customers globally. So um, to uh, nurture that diversity, um, we need to create an environment to our people where they feel the inclusivity and also the belonging. That's the reason at AWS we lead with inclusion. So this is a playbook uh, on the screen you see, uh, AWS inclusion play playbook. This is for our customers. When you go uh, to Google, uh, you Google this, and then you will be able to see this and download it. And if you have any questions, you know my name now, you can always get connected with me, ask any questions, and ask for help. So this is this document, this playbook is actually created purely for our customers to get inspired. So thank you so much. This is it. Well done. Thank you. Just, can I ask you something just briefly before we head of on course. to the next? Of course. So what, what is your, um, so you said as well that you learned also a couple of things about taking up this role. Were there any things that you were surprised about, sort of what, what you what you found here when you jumped into the uh, uh, first inclusion uh, at, um, at Amazon? Yeah, so what I can say, look, I do this in inclusion diversity equity lead as, as a side job. Okay. So I'm not paid for this. You so the, it's important? It is important and mm -hmm. I jumped on yeah. it. Uh, the thing is, in AWS we work quite a lot. What we do is like uh, by heart, but if you take something extra next to it, you need to love it. Yeah. If you don't love it, then it collapses. Yeah. So you need to be careful if you pick up such a thing. You should have the passion and the drive and everything. And what, yeah, th 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 this was not a surprise because I, I had the passion, mm -hmm. but uh, having that bandwidth, the time to spend, yeah. it is sometimes surprising. Just, uh, because it is a huge topic. It's not yeah. just women. It's not just people with disabilities. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. Because there are people who <coughs> do this job. It's a full-time job for them. We do this life side job. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Cool. Well, well done. Thank you so much. Are there any questions in the room? Perhaps. Great. Was I dead uh, clear with my story? <laughs> <laughs> I think you did well. So uh, let's give her a big hand then. Then it's time for uh, Railbank, I uh, believe.
I recognize well. Oh yeah, please indeed uh, scan the QR code and rate the presentation if you want, so we can give feedback uh, as well and compare. QR code, just easily just scan it and you can with Menti very quite easily. <coughs> Let us know what you thought. <coughs> cool. Dan Hort, can I ask you to go forward? Look forward to hear your story. How we make picking this up. Thank you. Let's give her a big uh, hand, everyone. Thanks. Well, first of all, I would like to share like huge respect to the great job that you are doing, Olin. Great. Like doing this beside your job is amazing. So I just wanted to start with that. Thank you so much. Pleasure. So my name is Hort. I work as change manager for diversity, equity, and inclusion in Rabobank. So I'm FTE, fully paid to do this job. <laughs> That's the, maybe the, the only difference between us, but the passion, I would say, <coughs> is the same. So I will take you in a short journey with me, how I built the strategy for DE in Rabobank, and why is it very important. To start with that, in Rabobank, we have our mission, growing a better world together. We have three ambitions that we want to achieve with that in our position in the Netherlands, globally, and in the leader, to be a leader in the Fender finance globally. To achieve that, we have four drivers. I'm not going to take you through that, and not all this as well. However, I want you to zoom on employee Empower employee. That's something we have in Rabobank. It's an essence for us. And here you can see a culture where everyone feels safe, respected, and valued. The E and I, we use not DNA, we use DE and I, diversity, equity, and inclusion. As you can see here, it's a part of our DNA. So we have a moral case where we need to support diversity, equity, and inclusion in Rabobank. In addition to that, there is a solid business case why diversity, equity, and inclusion is an essential in our company. Here, McKinsey research indicated that when you talk about retention and retaining and recruiting new employees, 64% of the candidate indicated that diversity is very important in evaluating the job offer. 54% indicated that they are willing to find another job if their employer is not committed to D and I. Psychological safety. It's very needed to have DEI in order to create a safer and healthier work environment. Boost performance, money. 33% you can increase your profit comparing to other companies who lack inclusion in the same field. When we talk about innovation revenue, 19%. And we have 60% enhancement in decision making when you have a diverse team. These are coming from McKinsey 2019. Yes, but what about the Netherlands? Luckily in Rabobank, we have a wonderful colleague called Susanna Biker. She's a professor at Utrecht University. <coughs> and she made a study about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the Netherlands. With a study of 1,500 companies, big, small, and mid-sized companies, she did a survey where she ended up with a full report. Here you can see a link below. Lack of inclusion puts 40% of companies at a disadvantage in the labor market. To explain more, I'm not going to take you through this in depth, however, just briefly, more inclusion corresponds to a 10% lower probability of having difficulties filling in vacancies. What does that mean? If you have more uh, inclusive part in your organization, you will face 10% less uh, 
less difficulty in hiring candidates. The other one related to revenue growth. 10% higher probability of increasing revenue growth if you have more inclusive culture in your company. And here we are talking about revenue for the future and predictability of the future. You have 9% less uncertainty about their future revenue for the companies who have more inclusive culture. We have the moral case and we have the business case. Combined, we can make a bold statement that DEI is not a nice to have, it's a must have. So in Rabobank, we have a guiding principles where, where we stated that as a cooperative bank, we work towards a work environment where everyone can be their authentic selves. Here, there is a very important part. Why respecting others? In Rabobank, we don't ask our employees just to fit in, but we ask them to belong. With that, everyone feels safe, respected, and valued. There is no we unless there is you and me. Taking that into consideration, we cascaded the story from the strategy, the big strategy of Rabobank, to the DEI strategy. There is a full five-year plan I made. I'm not going to take you through it, but just briefly about this part to see how I cascaded the story from strategy Rabobank to DEI strategy to deliverables. Starting point, we have our mission. As I stated, everyone feel their authentic selves. Ambition, we create that by focusing on two things, behavioral inclusion and structural inclusion. What does that mean? Behavioral inclusion is about behaviors, it's about values and behaviors. <coughs> structural inclusion, and that's the missing part most of the time, it's about policy processes, and that's what is missing. So to do that, we have four pillars we need to focus on. Recruiting and retaining, inclusion and belonging, uncovering and understanding biases and blind spots, and data. And here what we did. So, as you can see, we came up with KPIs to measure the progress on DE&I. Whether is it related to gender, culture, psychological safety, uh, e-learnings related to that. The deliverables part, each one of these small pockets is a full project that we are running. So, uh, the, just mentioned about the inclusion agents, we, uh, the inclusion uh, awareness people, we have inclusion agents. We have eight different ERGs, employee resource groups, the underrepresented groups, and other projects as well you can see. With all of that, what did that add to us? This is coming from the last quarter, 2023. Out of the survey, engagement survey, quarterly, 94% of our employees internally indicated that they have equal treatment. When we talk about psychological safety, 87% have psychological safety. My manager inspires me, we scored 83%. That's the average data. The age we have, 41. Total employees enlisted in the ERGs groups, we have more than 12,000 colleagues in one of the eight under hold your celebration, I would say, until everything is fixed and stated. Yes? Any other questions? Yeah, yeah I worked at Robin Bank two years ago, and it was a great place to work if you look like me. But uh, honestly, I didn't see many or at all people that were not by in leadership positions. Yes. And I'm not even talking about the management board. And if I look at the management board now, it's also it's more female uh, now, but still, I don't see a lot of diversity in terms of ethical backgrounds. Uh, what do you think is the reason behind that? Is it, and are you gonna be able to improve that? Well, thanks for sharing, old colleague. So I would say, first of all, the difficulty to register the data. Based on the GDPR, we are not allowed to have data except the gender part. So we took the CBS data, we needed to go to uh, CBS to get our data of our employees because we are not allowed to ask them to register the cultural data. So how can you measure something that you can't have in hand? 
that was one of the difficulties that I learned about the GDP, uh, uh, the LGBTQ plus, about the different ability people. So I think that's the starting point. That's why it's very difficult to tackle this part. However, what's happening most of the time, people take that as an excuse not to do things. When I started on the cultural data part two years ago, we had nothing about cultural data. I said, we will have mirroring society, CBS, they said 25% should be the data of society, like cultural matters, uh, people in the Netherlands. I said, okay, let's have that as target, but we don't have data. Let's have that as a target, and then let's see what's gonna happen. Putting the cultural KPI allowed us to go with pilot with CBS in two domains, and later on get all the data from uh, CBS. But you should do it sequentially and be ambitious. Now things are changing more, like we have a new redesign just started also like in different two domains as well. So we hope that things will change. Is it certain? No, because the recruitment part is not really standing up to be vocal about whom to be hired and to play the key role that you need to play. So there are some changes happening, like if you go down to the floor, you will see different, but indeed on the higher level. So also when you look at the data, be aware about, the, we are talking about the average. My concern is more about like the, the layer below, about the differences of the percentages who lead to this average. So 11 and 45, that's too big. So why is this the case? Now we are working on it. So I don't have to answer why these are the numbers, but later on, before the end of this year, we have a plan per domain why we scored like that. So we need the governmental support honestly on this part. So I don't know if in France you have something like this you can reach out to or not. No, no I'm just saying because I know that. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's the only reason why I'm saying it. But there is always a way to hack the system. So. Yeah, thank you. Because yes. you can't even register it, I think, uh, voluntarily, right? You say to 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 support diversity and inclusion, we would like to register uh, any preferences you have or uh, cultural background or whatever to identify that in an anonymous way. But you can, can you do that actually yes. APR wise? I think right. As long we, as it's anonymous, we can register that based on voluntary base. However, we did that in 2021. Okay. The, the respondents rate was only 25 percent. Why? Because people were hesitant. Why do you ask me about my culture? Mm -hmm. That was before we built the strategy. So if you want to ask people to share and be vulnerable about those specific personal data, first of all, listen learn and tell them why you want to the data in the first place. What are you going to do with the data? Yeah. And when the data is going to be terminated, so you are not allowed to use the data again. So that's a lesson learned. And yeah, now we don't use that anymore, but yes, are allowed in the US in our offices in the US they are they register all the data gender okay. culture sexual orientation you have it all in work day the same system we have mm -hmm. but they are not allowed to have KPIs in that part you see like the nuances and that's the beauty I say about this topic you can, it's not one size fit all you can't come up with one blueprint all right then uh, I'm going to uh, try and uh, enlighten you a little bit about some developments of FinTech over the past quarter uh, just to hopefully identify a couple of trends that might be interesting for you as well to follow and see where uh, where things might be heading from here onwards. Of course, uh, we've talked about this already a little bit. Uh, the Artificial Intelligence Act uh, was indeed uh, approved by, by Parliament. Uh, and uh, despite there might probably still be some steps, legal steps on the way before it's actually poured into law, especially on national level, uh, it's going to, it's pretty clear now what it's going to look like. and. Uh, very much going to be very dominant. I think it's interesting to see as well is that it's a really big deal for a lot of companies, but you actually see that the way that the financial industry has been really careful so far to actually embrace uh, artificial intelligence, except for very specific domains, like for example fraud detection, um, uh, or for example uh, facial recognition with identification, there's a couple of other areas where the, especially AI has been applied. But in general, you see that for credit scoring, for customer acquisition, there's a lot of other domains where actually a lot of parties are still really hesitant to use AI. Uh, first of all, because there's already a lot of uh, discussion about whether banks should have access to all the data and whether they should be able to make use of that to draw certain conclusions. I think similar to the discussion we were having about whether you should know exactly the profiles of, the, of your employees. The same thing happens with customers as well. So I think where you actually see the the biggest jumps is 
in, uh, especially on the level of marketing and online uh, distribution, right? So I think that's where uh, artificial intelligence really has this wide scope of, uh, of uh, applications that are really close to the personal domain, but at the same time, there's also much less legislation ruling it so far. So that's, I think, where also the AI Act is going to have an impact. Similarly to what we saw with the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, which have also come into force quite recently, and we've also seen that, uh, for example, the EU has stepped up their game in questioning, especially the big tech platforms, about their uh, uh, impact on their customers, the way they actually use their market power, and potentially give fights out for that as well. Uh, so I think that what, what we generally learn is that the EU is very active to regulate markets beyond the financial industry, uh, but you still see that the financial industry is still regulated by itself uh, on top of that, and constantly has to balance, okay, we see general digital legislation coming up, and we see specific financial regulation coming up, like for example, uh, FIDA coming up now, the financial uh, uh, data uh, sharing uh, legislation that's coming up as a follow-up of the open banking regulation we had earlier, and so on. So quite interesting, I think, to see what's keep on coming from, uh, from Europe. So that's going to be a topic every quarter. I'm pretty sure uh, we can talk about it. Um, but what else is going on? I think it's quite interesting to see as well, between all the tech giants that are fighting for uh, uh, supremacy in uh, new, actually production of AI and becoming the AI platform, Right, with Microsoft, for example, having invested in OpenAI last year, uh, you see that all the platforms from Google to Amazon to everyone, there's developing AI tool sets to supply uh, those tools to, to everybody. And since you can see actually some of those collaborations sometimes, in this case between Apple and Google, where they say, okay, let's instead of further developing Siri, we might actually use Google's uh, uh, AI engine to support AI, uh, uh, Apple's tooling. I think that's quite an interesting one. We've seen those kind of developments as well. On, uh, uh, on other cases where, for example, if you think about it, for example, between Samsung and Apple, there's also all kinds of collaborations, even though they are competitors at the same time as well. Right? All your iPhone screens are made by Samsung, for example. So uh, these kind of things are, are, even though they're fighting each other out and having all these kind of pet of troll uh, uh, fights with each other in court, at the same time they're collaborating as well. And so it's interesting to see how this is going to develop the relationship between Google and uh, Apple, for example. Um, at the same time, what's interesting as well, uh, what we see is some of, some of the bigger investment firms putting in a fund together to support Ukraine. Uh, of course, we've seen a lot of government money being poured into Ukraine <coughs> so far, and it's quite nice to see actually that there's a support fund setting up, especially focused on Ukraine now, uh, uh, by some of the larger asset management managers, allowing everyone to take, take a stake in that. Uh, well, it's probably not too far uh, from here that we also look at something like that for the Gaza area and other regions where there might be a big impact and where private funds might, for example, also uh, have an impact to, uh, to restore you know, uh, the, the, the proceeds of war and all the damages that have been done. Um, interesting to see how some uh, fintech companies are diversifying Robinhood by, for example, offering a credit card besides their investment platform. Right, so of course, Robinhood was always very much known by the meme coin, uh, by, by the meme investment stocks uh, last year, uh, where a couple of stocks were promoted through some of the tech platforms like Reddit. Uh, that actually uh, they were uh, very popular to get invested in, but because these investors were ready to gather in a, in a discussion group uh, and then promoted uh, a stock that was generally going down, and they thought, okay, if there are a lot of short sellers, let's try and squeeze them out by buying this stock altogether. Uh, and they created quite some uh, turbulence in the market. Um, also, Robinhood was quite well scrutinized for that, so it actually had to pull them back quite a little bit because they were actually held responsible as well for these, uh, the behavior of these kinds of, kinds of investors. Quite a tough job, I would say, from their end. But now you see that they're actually moving forward with credit cards that they're offering uh, as well as they're offering. So you see that where we've seen at the beginning that most of the fintech companies had a really narrow product offering, uh, focusing on doing just one thing. We've already seen with the Neo Bank that they were expanding from just offering payment reels to actually also opening up their balance sheet for lending, mortgages, saving products, uh, and actually turning into regular banks, albeit didn't run digitally. You see the same thing now as well with investment platforms like Robinhood, and so I would expect as well that other platforms are moving in the same direction and becoming more and more of a bank altogether. Um, the, spit, uh, the spot Bitcoin ETF, which was uh, approved uh, last year, uh, became quite popular. 50 billion was poured into it uh, over, the, over the recent period, and it really sparked a big upside on the Bitcoin prices, and it took along in its wake 
uh, quite a lot of other Bitcoin uh, or other cryptocurrencies as we saw it, uh, especially because everyone's just expecting a lot of institutional demand for it, those cryptocurrencies, uh, putting them big, big, quite on the rise. But at the same time, we also see that cryptocurrencies are still being scrutinized quite a lot by the regulators who are trying to play down the game, uh, at least looking at uh, anti-money laundering uh, to fight it. Uh, but of course, for example, here in the case of WorldCoin, there's some real concerns about privacy uh, in the way that you can use it. So I think that's quite an interesting uh, development as well. And I think from that perspective, we'll keep on seeing always a mix of positive and negative news, I think, around crypto. It seems to be uh, all quite quite balanced uh, generally uh, across the time. Um, interesting to see that now as well some fintech companies are being scrutinized for uh, not keeping to Russia uh, sanctions. So we know of course that the financial industry has played a very instrumental role to maintain the sanctions that have been imposed by a lot of Western countries uh, like the EU but also the US on uh, uh, Russian uh, companies and Russian individuals. And I think it's uh, interesting to see now that very often there have been some kind of companies that were a bit lenient to just offer their services to, com to parties that may have been on the sanctions list and now actually uh, the US in any case is coming down on them. So there's definitely a risk for fintech companies to, uh, to keep in mind that besides, of course, your AML that needs to be in order if you do transactions, also the sanctions uh, are becoming a real risk of, uh, of who you have to do business with. Um, then two parts of news I think are interesting from the past uh, past quarter in the Netherlands. The multi safe pay has been acquired by the Ant Group, uh, known as uh, from Alipay Alibaba. And the uh, Neobank Knop, which used to be owned by Egon, a large insurance firm, has been sold to the Austrian Baywack Group. Uh, so you see that uh, they were looking for Knop uh, uh, have been sold have been sold uh, to uh, another insurer in a package deal of the Egon assets in the Netherlands and they wanted to get rid of it uh, quite soon. So they've been sold now, but I would expect them to actually really continue to grow in the Dutch market with this new shareholder, but they're really going to also expand their services abroad in, uh, in the rest of Europe. So quite interesting to see that, especially the Dutch region now becomes much more open since they've got this uh, Austrian shareholder. Um, anything uh, we missed? I mean, this is of course uh, some highlights from a couple of months, but any news that you picked up over the last quarter that you say, like, hey, this is also what's really interesting. We should definitely know about this. The MasterCard thing. The MasterCard thing? The... Oh, sorry. Um... <laughs> Which MasterCard thing? <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> but, but this is US based. This is. Uh... No, no, it doesn't matter. Uh... Um, oh, man. Sorry if I'm quoting it wrong, but basically, they settled the dispute uh, whereby. Oh, yeah. Yeah, basically yeah, the, 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 inter interchange, the interchange, interchange rates are going to be Exactly, changed. so Visa and MasterCard pull yes. together, and yes. I think they together, yes. yeah, exactly, Visa and MasterCard pull together to indeed uh, lower that interchange rate uh, fees in, uh, in the U.S. and settled, I think, the sort of... Uh, fixed so, for the next fixed. years. Thank exactly, you. Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, they, I'm sorry, that. they also um, eliminated the, kind of, I, I forgot what it's called, but basically the, the fairness in showcasing which, like, which payment methods, so now, a vendor, a merchant can can uh, yeah utilize or, or promote yep. uh, a payment method uh, versus another, which is and they can add surcharges to that as well. Yeah, no, exactly. I think that's also a bit following the whole discussion between Apple and some of the game developers on their marketplace, right? So uh, uh, I don't remember the name of the game developer. Epic. Epic, exactly. Yeah. So indeed, Epic was uh, suing Apple for being overcharged for uh, the payments that they were trying to do themselves for the in a, in a purchase on the platform, and Apple of course had to give in there, and I think that also resonated with other parts of the industry that said, okay, indeed we can't take such a big chunk of these payments uh, if we offer the platform for that, so they really had to lean in and lower the fees and give much more options for payments to all these kind of players that are sort of interlinked in this platform, so really to reduce the dependencies kind of. Uh, so yeah, definitely a good point, thanks. I saw a figure here, yeah, Michael? Well, just that this week, you know, the European governments, in parallel to we talked about the, the big banks, they're putting together a hundred billion dollar fund for aid to Ukraine. Yeah. On, on their own, it's a so-called Trump-proofing the, uh, you know, the money uh, aid, aid to, to Ukraine. So you know, yeah. no, matter, no matter who wins the election. You know, but. Definitely, also a neat smart move, uh, perhaps, uh, given the potential outcomes of the elections in the US, uh, I think in Europe is also stepping in the market. So it's, uh, it's neat uh, true that they also set up a new fund, which I think is also a really good idea to support uh, Ukraine on that. Yeah, thanks. Any other suggestions? 
Yeah. Uh, last month, the uh, European Commission uh, passed a regulation uh, amendment for the Student Finality Directive, allowing uh, payment and e-money institutions to directly access CSMs, as well as instant payment regulation enabling uh, mandatory instant payments in all of Europe starting next year. Exactly. That's also a really good point, indeed. Uh, that also gives, indeed, payment firms and e-money licensed parties direct access to the Target 2 uh, interbank uh, exchange rails which of course is also a big feature uh, for, for fintech companies as well that are in the payment space, that they can now actually, instead of having to have a partner bank that gives them access to these uh, target two rails, they could actually directly get access to that uh, given their license. Yeah, definitely also very interesting. To, and that's very funny indeed because in, um, some, for example in the UK, instant payments is a really big deal and there's, there's a couple of countries where it really matters, but you see that in Europe, especially since consumers very often already experience sort of instant payments, it's not a really big deal, at least on the retail side, uh, but indeed on the back-end side for banks, uh, and especially also the payments firms, it's a really big deal, yeah, for sure. Thanks. All right, I'll keep it with that. Then I've got a few more things to share with you. Um, and we also try to, so basically the news that we actually take is uh, from our newsletter that we send out on a, on a Friday uh, afternoon every, every week where we uh, basically try to highlight what's happening every week and we so we got the news and try to give you some of the highlights here on the, on the event. Uh, but we sort of track their news, uh, funding, uh, analysis and opinion, as well as research papers that we fund. And some of the research papers here uh, from McKinsey's was focusing on uh, how Gen AI, and Gen AI could actually uh, support banking, uh, quite an interesting one, where they really advocate to get a that in the current phase, uh, a highly centralized uh, solution is quite likely to become the most successful uh, uh, approach for, uh, for these ways of actually implementing AI within banks. Uh, quite interesting paper. You can actually find these uh, on our website as well to download, and uh, perhaps we can actually also share it in, uh, in the follow up email after the event, together with some, for example, the, some of the links that were shared earlier. Um, then we'll just briefly look a bit at what happened in the investment market. Uh, so we looked at the Q4, of uh, sorry, Q1 figures globally. There you actually see that uh, funding has been relatively slow uh, globally for fintech uh, altogether. Um, uh, but nonetheless, there were actually still quite a, quite some nice deals. Uh, ULEN launched uh, a lot of, raised a lot of funding. Uh, investment platform is basically it's it's not only equity; it's actually a mixed equity and debt uh, facility that they raised. Uh, insurance underwriting firm True uh, also launched and got a big chunk of uh, capital in. Uh, Canopy uh, is a venture fund that was raised uh, in Australia, and DigiPay was a large payment firm that uh, raised and I think it's the first unicorn in uh, in Turkey. Uh, so I think quite a good accomplishment for them as well. And I know that the Turkish uh, uh, fintech team was very much looking forward to uh, to actually having a success like this within their borders. So that's a definitely a nice achievement. Um, then if we look at the Dutch market, there you see, of course, also the similar funny spike in 2021, when of course all valuations went through the roof throughout uh, the fintech field. We see that actually, uh, even though that 2023 was uh, pretty pretty poor from a, from a perspective of 21 and 22, uh, in 23 wasn't that bad if you compare it to the year 2020 and before. So we were actually still doing quite well, uh, and especially in the first quarter, we actually did also massively well with a couple of large deals, of course, because we got two new unicorns in the Dutch market, uh, which triggered most of the most of the investment money. But overall, I think we can be quite happy with how fintech is still kept picking up. So here are some of the investment deals: uh, Data Snipper, uh, especially serving accountants with their data uh, provision, uh, became a unicorn. Uh, in dollars, of course, not in euros. Um, uh, Finom raised some quite some nice money as a challenger bank, uh, and they do what, which is a business management platform uh, focused on uh, uh, travel, uh, raised quite a serious sum. Then we've got a couple of other ones: Billing, uh, buy now, pay later solutions, uh, Moose, uh, which is a property management system, also became a unicorn. Uh, D2X, uh, crypto derivatives, derivative exchange, also raised quite some nice funding. And iSecurity, a uh, security platform, which also raised quite some money from uh, both banks and is looking after especially security, cyber security and combined it with insurance. So quite some nice, uh, nice funding rounds. And I think from that perspective, we can definitely conclude that uh, the fintech market is still quite booming 
in the, uh, in the Dutch region, so we're quite, quite happy with that. Um, then, before we head on to the next presentations, uh, I think, or did we have the code plan now? Oh, we can do the code later, right? Can we do it? Yeah. Okay. Um, just one thing, one of the next things we're popping up. So, um, uh, Arfong Sonko is, uh, uh, is the managing director of uh, Rewire here based in the Netherlands. He's going to be on our board, uh, or proposed to be a board member, I should say, in our next general assembly at the Home Fintech. Uh, and he's from Senegal, and uh, he's been working here uh, both in the UK as well as in, uh, in the Netherlands for quite a while. And while we were discussing, we actually had the idea there was quite a lot of interest to figure out whether we could actually work with the African diaspora that is based here in the Netherlands or largely in Europe, and actually connect that to people that are actually operating in Africa at the moment, either because they're based there and have a link with Europe, or whether there are Europeans that have been started to work there, to just figure out whether there are business opportunities or learnings we can share. And we've uh, decided to set up an event for that, so we're doing that on the 13th May, uh, and I think that also could be interesting for you, perhaps, if you're interested in the African market uh, uh, to learn what's going on there, what kind of companies are succeeding there, what kind of challenges you're trying to solve, uh, as well as if you are here and you have some kind of African roots and you'd like to share experience as well about what's going on, we'd le definitely like to invite you. We're going to have some interesting speakers from both sides of the table. So some people are based in Africa and going to share their experiences, as well as some people from here. And we see this as a step up to establish a more continuous network of uh, collaboration between uh, Europe and Africa altogether. So we think that there's much more we can do there between the two continents. Uh, and well, the more we share stories and the more we get to know each other better, we think the better the business opportunities and collaboration could be. Uh, so definitely, you'll uh, through our website you'll be able to sign up for this uh, if you'd like, and let us know if you're interested in this uh, because we'd like to definitely get your feedback on this. Sorry, which part of Africa? Sorry. Do you have any specific countries in Africa? So uh, what we're doing now, uh, we, we were discussing this quite a lot, uh, and we're focusing first on uh, English speaking, uh, mostly East uh, East Central Africa. Uh, and, uh, and Nigeria, because we've basically got some context there, and that's quite easy to go around. For example, we were discussing about whether Senegal would be a good starting point. We see that it actually a lot of people think that then French might be a hurdle, because it's less easy for at least Dutch people or a lot of Europeans to go around with that. Uh, even though we do believe that actually what we're trying to do as well is a lot of, uh, Europe, a lot of entrepreneurs in Senegal, for example, do actually speak English, but so we try to also give them a spot in the room. But we're taking it region by region and trying to expand it at least to the whole of Africa. Yeah, I've been doing some work in Nigeria and uh, Kenya. Oh, yeah. Also. Oh, nice. And quality of fintech startups are quite Yeah, no, exactly. I think there's a lot of uh, great uh, great uh, entrepreneurs there and uh, some really great business opportunities. So it's great to be able to share that, as well as <coughs> uh, the people that are here and finding out you know, what it's like to do business here or to, to explore where the, where the connection is. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah. Are there any other questions about this? We're just opening it up. Otherwise, we'd more than happy to have you on the 30th. It's an online session to start first, and we're going to follow up then with a physical uh, in-person meeting uh, here first. And the end goal is as well to actually then at some point make a trip to Africa to visit a couple of countries and then see if we can do that in repeat. Uh, but that's more ambition in the long run. First, we're going to start with something small. Um, yes, yeah, so the Kahoot we're going to skip for now. So then I'd like to see if yours uh, is ready for yeah, yeah, it was. his presentation and demo. Let's give it a big hand, everyone. More like a short pitch. A very quick one. Stage. Um, I was last time I was at uh, Holland FinTech and we talked about the European uh, regulation. I had a, I had a uh, 2.0 identity wallet uh, and I thought, wow, uh, nice uh, developments uh, and we created a future uh, and that was in the line of the identity wallets. And I thought maybe it's nice to show and ask you after my pitch for some questions and some help. <coughs> so that's why I'm here. Uh, 
uh, my name is Joris Lange. I work at Inverit. They're the creators of Read ID, and they showed the product last year during one of the All of the Techs uh, events. We are a leading NFC-based NFC identity verification solution. Uh, I work for Inverit at Inverit since the beginning of January. Before Inverit, I worked at Rabobank, lead product owner, and I was the CEO of Datakeeper, one of the first identity wallets in the Netherlands. Uh, and as well, Datakeeper, as Rabobank, uh, use Read ID for onboarding their new customers, for digital onboarding their new customers. We already uh, trust the brand. We work together with a lot of different companies in the Netherlands, Europe, and also outside Europe, uh, New Zealand, for instance. It's not a pitch about the environment. Uh, so last time, uh, we talked about the new European regulations, and my very, very simple translation is that within a few years, every citizen of every member state in Europe will have a digital identity wallet on its phone. I strongly believe in that. And with this digital identity wallet, you can share your digital personal information with all kinds of companies, etc., uh, for all kinds of different customer journeys. And I think it looks something like this. Uh, in your wallet you store all kinds of credentials, about your diplomas, about your travel, businesses. Uh, but the most important one will be your electronic identity, your EID, also called a PIT, a personal identification data. And somebody is issuing that PIT, and the most logical partner will be your national government, uh, because they are the most trusted partners uh, in this case. Uh, but it's also possible that uh, uh, private companies will help you issuing your personal identification data, your electronic ID. Vendors of parts like, for instance, my, my company in Verit, but it's also possible with a lot of other vendors who are already operating in this market. This is the scheme, and in the middle you see the, the wallet, and that's the wallet of me, I'm the, I'm the holder, and there's some kind of authentic document, authentic source. Uh, there will be a party to issue it into your wallet, uh, as I told you, it can be the, the local of the, the, your, your own government, and it can also be other parties. It will be issued in your wallet, and that's the possibility to share it with all kinds of other parties. And that is maybe a quite simple process. Uh, but as I say, there will be a lot of different identity wallets on the market. In the Netherlands already, maybe already more than 10 parties uh, exploring the possibility of being a digital identity wallet. And they all have to connect with all kinds of uh, uh, governments, with all kinds of uh, vendors who will uh, supply for the uh, digital identity. Uh, so we create a sort of solution that you don't have to integrate our product as SDK anymore, that you don't have to integrate, don't have to download separate apps anymore. Uh, and I'm trying to ask the audience afterwards, after I show the demo, uh, if there are some parts interesting to cooperate with me, with me uh, to experiment, experiment with me, or to try it out in a sort of POC uh, kind of way uh, to develop it further on. Of course, I would like to give a, uh, a live demo, and of course, uh, it, <laughs> it didn't work, unfortunately. But I have a small video, uh, because I was prepared, and that shows also the pro exact process. So you have a wallet. Everybody will have a wallet. And somewhere that during that wallet, you have to... Oh, wait, 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 let's go sure. a bit too fast. We, don't see, we see the presentation. Oh, sorry, yeah. So I'll show, I'll show the process of somebody who has a wallet and wants to get his EID in his wallet. Without, uh, so without that the wallet is connected with any sort of SDK or uh, you have to download a separate app to complete that. So this is the wallet there, the, the purple thing, the EU wallet, can be any wallet. And during that process, 
the world is asking, give me your e-identity. And now he makes connection with, in this case, ReadID. We do our NFC stuff. We are reading out your document. It's a fully 100% safe way. And then at the end, it will be connected again with the NFC process. and I know that the holder is also holding the real document. And this will be the part that is the most interesting part of the demo. This information what is gathered and then I bring it back to the wallet. Let's see. And in this case my identity credentials are stored in this kind of AU wallet, that can be any wallet. Uh, and that's important because in the, from that part uh, I can share it with all kinds of other parties who need my personal credentials. Uh, and we already connected with It's Me and Datkeeper, both in Belgium and the Netherlands. It's integrated with NSCK, but as I, as I explained, we don't want to work. Uh, we, don't, we will work with SK, but we are looking, searching for parties who would like to experiment this process with, uh, with us and trying to help uh, with sort of POC. Uh, uh, if we can work it out together, uh, this kind of processes. Hopefully, I'm a little bit clear about our goals and terms uh, and purposes. Uh, and hopefully, there are some parties in the audience would think, hey, that's interesting for our case, for our company, uh, and we can do some business together, we can experiment, especially experiment together, and do a business later on. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Well done. Uh, thank you for the first. Uh, what kind of use case do you have in mind for this especially, right? So I think, uh, because for example, if I would have this, this wallet on my phone, yeah. I would be able to, someone ask for my identity, how would it work? How would they validate the validity of this, for example? Yeah, the, um, as I said, at the end, everybody will have a sort of a digital identity wallet on his phone. And it's, you can use it for all kinds of use cases mm -hmm. to prove that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just like I'm very curious about if you've thought about other applications for this. So the first thing I thought when I saw it was the, the Corona Pass thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But also medical, like it would be really useful for medical information. Yeah, the, the, I mean, the wallets will supply it in the future. I, I, I believe in that. And I, and I think, uh, and we are not the wallet. We are, we are a sort of provider of your electronic identity. Mm -hmm. But the wallets will supply all kinds of customer journeys, uh, onboarding, medical journeys, travel uh, journeys. I think there will be a lot of possibilities for being in digital identity wallet. Yeah. You also look at derived uh, data, like for example, right, so very often you'll be asked for your identification, yeah. but they actually just want to know whether you're older than 18. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's, that's a possibility with, with possibility with wallet, eh? you don't have to share all your information, all your, your, your not your complete uh, copy of your passport, you only share that you are older than 18 years old, yeah. or you only share my last name, or... Yeah. 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 Uh, what sort of identity fraud uh, capabilities you might have? Because just imagining the situation when your ID get leaked, for example, with yeah. all the sensitive data that is uh, right now on the underground forums yeah. and so on, somebody could actually use your application uh, or use AI for the fake document, yeah. and then have it signed by your application, telling so like, oh, yeah, that's yeah. me, basically. So, what sort of the um, yeah, or that's why I explained that the e-identity e will be the most important part for such identity wallets and that has to be trusted for 100%. So uh, the, 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 your government is maybe a good party for uh, providing the e-identity. Uh, with ReadID, we read out the NFC chip of your document mm -hmm. and we always say fake identities don't have an NFC chip. Uh, Till now, we, had, we, didn't, we have done more than millions of transactions. We didn't find any uh, false uh, acceptance rate. Uh, so, yeah, it's very important to 
know for 100% sure that you are you and that's your digital identity world or your uh, digital identity what is used in a certain case. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think in that case, also something that would definitely require also government uh, help because I think they're, they should also facilitate yes. at least a wallet or something like that that you can that you can also use it as government, yeah. for example. Yeah, yeah. It's not on the agenda. It's not on the agenda for the next two or three years. That they are trying to produce a wallet, but the bit, uh, the, the the electronic identity, is not on the agenda for the next two years. And I think there will be a lot of identity wallets uh, coming to the Netherlands are and uh, already are in the Netherlands. So there is a certain need for a, a certain uh, trusted key identity. Yeah, uh, yeah. Exactly. I think you have to think a lot about, about all the KYC that's being done. Yeah, 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 yeah uh, exactly. It's, yeah. it's all done manually. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. yeah. When it comes to uh, like uh, industries like travel, are there any uniform requirements from that perspective which are kind of being laid out or that's not happening yet? Yeah, uh, when you look to the uh, identity world and to European legislation, there are some large scale pilots, and the travel use case is one of those. Uh, part of a large pilot to investigate because at, of course travel is one of the most interesting customer journeys for uh, yeah, to digitalize it. Uh, I don't know if there are already are any standards, etc. Okay, yep, go ahead. Thanks Joris. Just the business model you have is based on the governmental support later on. For the coming two, three years there is nothing on their agenda, so okay, you don't need that. But later on it's a zero sum game, like if they decide to yeah. go with the app themselves, yeah. this business model will be out. Yeah, maybe maybe it is, and I think there will be room for as well as a government electronic identity and private ele electronic identities. But maybe there isn't. That's the yeah, that, so that, that, that can be a risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what's your long term strategy in that case? Uh, um, Already we're exploring to uh, New Zealand and Australia, uh, we're exploring to Canada, so we're exploring other markets and other use cases, uh, but from, from now on uh, we are just focusing as our only product, uh, read ID, so yeah, that's, that's, that is a risk, yeah, future risk, yeah, nice question, yeah. <laughs> on a positive note, let's uh, give you no, 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 just a little bit. <laughs> Probably we know that these markets don't are not that binary generally, so there's always a lot of opportunities. Yeah, I think so. I think Even if some windows close, others will open. Uh, uh, yeah. But uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I think uh, it was a speedy uh, demo, but it was uh, was uh, good to see it. <laughs> um, please also read your presentation. So I hope you have been able to also either get the QR code or go back to your browser to read it. Yes, go on over. Love to hear from you. Okay, let's give you a big hand. Uh, here's the ticker if you want. Good luck. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. Colin uh, Schutte for arranging this nice event and the previous speakers, covering which uh, covered really important, really nice topics. Thank you. Uh, my name is Alan Alexander. I am the Chief Strategy Officer and Board Member at Aquapay. Uh, we are an international uh, fintech software vendor, or banking software vendor, and fintech consulting company. Uh, today I will speak how we help impact startups to launch their business uh, at reasonable cost, uh, effectively and efficiently. Uh, so, just a couple of words about us. Uh, so we are an international company. Uh, we are based, uh, actually we are based in Amsterdam, uh, in Tallinn, Estonia, in Canada, in Toronto. So we are our physical offices. We also have our back office in Serbia and Belgrade with our developers. Uh, also in Madrid, in Warsaw, where I live. Uh, our office in Amsterdam was launched just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so we are quite new here. Uh, we hire around 50 people and we have around 20 customers for our project and software. Most of them are fintechs, mostly licensed, authorized in European countries, in Canada, uh, in Africa as well. Uh, and we have around 50 active consulting projects which are related to payment infrastructure development, business structuring, and, uh, uh, and 
and licensing uh, proceedings. Uh, so uh, we have two business lines. So on one hand, that's our IT product. On the other hand, uh, our consulting division. And generally, our role uh, is to help fintech launch uh, their business from scratch. So we design a payment scheme for them. We find a proper form how to start operations. Uh, and uh, our role is to be one-stop shop for new fintech companies, new neo banks, uh, evolved companies, remittance companies. Uh, so, which helps them to launch. So we take care of all legal IT stuff, and they just do their job when it comes to product, uh, when it comes to marketing, sales. Uh, so uh, our core banking software Matrobank, so it's a typical core banking software. So uh, it consists of customer front end and back end part. Uh, when it comes to front end, it's mobile application, web application, uh, at the level of back end, uh, it's general letter is payment functionalities like account opening, different types of transfers, so SWIFT SEPA, non-SWIFT payment rails, uh, it's back office, uh, integrations, API of course, uh, and when it comes to our advisory services, so as I mentioned, we are focused on licensing and on creation, design creation uh, for new world fintechs. Uh, so our mission uh, is uh, to enhance the financial connectivity of the world and uh, accessibility of online payment services. We want to make the services accessible for everyone and we help local teams to launch their products. Uh, I want to speak about examples of productivity problems. Uh, so uh, while we started uh, working mostly with European customers around six years ago, uh, now I think at least 50% of our customers are customers uh, which uh, reside in Africa, in India, in Asia and work with underbanked or even unbanked communities and also European companies uh, which focus on immigrant communities and uh, these categories of fintechs so very important problems. Um, I will explain just one or two of them. So on one hand, uh, it's quite hard, for example, to send funds to such countries as uh, Pakistan or a lot of African countries, uh, which are considered to be very high risk by regular banks. So it's costly, it uh, lasts long. Uh, and the second problem, it's an opposite problem, uh, sometimes it's very hard for African businesses, for example, for example, in Nigeria, to pay invoices in euros and, or in USD to pay their European suppliers. Uh, simply because central banks of uh, many African countries uh, impose restrictions <coughs> on buying currency uh, because these countries have negative trade balance, so they buy more than they sell, and uh, it has a negative impact on local currency rate. This is why central banks impose such restrictions. And uh, um, in such case, it's, uh, it's very individual. So uh, it's uh, generally snail banks and uh, traditional banks uh, cannot solve it because uh, really each such case requires a lot of knowledge about local market, uh, understanding uh, access to local commu to, to communities, and uh, what we uh, and what. Uh, we do. We help such startups. Uh, in many cases, these are bootstrap start startups, so companies without much capital financing, so just regular small businesses. Uh, we help them decrease costs and design cost efficient uh, payment scheme. I'll, I'll come back to the scheme later, so I'll provide a couple of examples of our customers, uh, which can be qualified as uh, impact index. So, one is Capimani. So it's a company uh, backed by Way Combinator, first million capital, and a lot of venture capital investors. This is a company operating uh, on one hand in Europe and uh, on the other hand uh, in different African countries. So what they do, so on one hand, they allow African businesses pay invoices uh, in euros, in USD, in Canadian dollars, uh, in different currencies. And on the other hand, they help other remittance companies to transfer funds from, uh, from Europe to Africa. Uh, they operate as a Canadian MSB now, with correspondent accounts in various European banks and uh, payment institutions. 
so this is what we have done to establish. And another case study is quite similar, so but they operate not in Francophone Africa, but uh, in Nigeria. So it's a local Nigerian team uh, with great experience in banking. Uh, so they launch you know, now they are launching their product uh, and we deliver them not just not, not only uh, all this organizational framework, but we also help them with our software. Uh, and the core idea of it's this company is to help Nigerians living in Nigeria. Uh, to receive money from Western corporations uh, they work for. So in Nigeria, there are a lot of developers, companies uh, who work for American companies, European companies, Canadian companies, and uh, it's uh, quite hard uh, for them to receive funds. And, uh, and on the other hand, uh, Wantel helps Nigerians who want to travel. So as I mentioned, uh, Central Bank of Nigeria imposes uh, restrictions on buying currency. And uh, it's uh, very hard to issue, I would say impossible to issue uh, a card, Nigerian card uh, in USD that, for example, will work uh, outside of Nigeria. So, for example, my business partners uh, from Nigeria, they come to London with paper cash, dollars, and literally buy, uh, buy prepaid card uh, for cash, for example. And uh, their startup uh, wants to solve this problem by issuing these prepaid cards outside of Nigeria, but for Nigerians. Uh, so there are different methods how we work, how we help such companies uh, to, uh, to launch their business. I'll show just a couple of payment schemes uh, that are used by such companies. Uh, this is what we help them to implement. So one is uh, matching uh, flows. One is incoming flow to Africa and outgoing flow. So for example, uh, in the high row, uh, you see local African payer. So for example, African business wants to buy something in Europe and pay huge invoice in euros. And, uh, and uh, uh, you have uh, their counterparties. So for example, uh, European uh, exporters, so supplier, uh, business which uh, sells something uh, to Africa. And in low, uh, low row, uh, you see uh, European payer. So it can be, for example, uh, immigrant uh, of African origin who wants to send funds to his or her family, and uh, local payee, so his uh, relative, uh, who wants to receive funds in local currency uh, without paying 7% or 10% whatever. Uh, and uh, one of possible payment schemes for this is just to match these flows, flows of funds. Uh, what, and uh, it allows us to implement a really cost-effective scheme. And uh, what is important that uh, within the scheme, uh, there is no uh, actual physical cross-border uh, funds movement. So simply, uh, FinTech collects euros in Europe from party which wants to pay, from 10,000 people for example, and then use these euros to cover the voice uh, issued by a European supplier. And on the other hand, they collect funds from in local currency uh, in Africa, and then use these funds to pay the relatives of uh, uh, African people living in Europe, for example. And this is one of the schemes, and another scheme that we also implement, uh, implemented several times during the last one half of a year, I think for around 10 companies. Uh, it's, uh, it may look uh, <coughs> complicated, uh, but uh, actually it's, it's uh, very effective. Uh, so, uh, and we use it uh, for my transfers to high-risk jurisdictions, for example, to Pakistan or to Nigeria as well. Uh, so uh, we uh, ask startup to obtain two licenses, for example, Canadian MSB. Canadian, we, we commonly use um, Canadian uh, Money Services business license because it's very easy and cheap to obtain, and it allows to operate internationally if you do promote, actively promote the services outside of Canada. As, and uh, local African license, so uh, for example, for Nigeria, it's uh, often a microfinance bank, so an institution which uh, can open correspondent, correspondent accounts in other institutions, in other banks. Uh, and uh, then uh, we, uh, for a Canadian company, uh, we open correspondent account, for example, euro, so in Canadian dollar, uh, in dollar as a, a basic currency. Uh, and uh, for African PSP, uh, we also open uh, correspondent account in USD and in local <coughs> currency, 
and this scheme allows to make transfer not from one person to another, not from one corporation to another, uh, but uh, this cross-border cross -border movement, uh, funds movement, is made between account of this person in one payment institution to account of the same person in another payment institution. And uh, this uh, allows uh, using uh, payment rails of Western banks so they do not consider this flow as high risk as, the, as direct payment from one person to another. And uh, this is how we solve the problem uh, of uh, money movement to high risk countries, for example. Uh, I think that's all I want to say today. So just a couple of words, maybe because we are new here in Amsterdam. Uh, so uh, one thing is if you also provide services to fintechs, so let's speak. Here is our partnership director, Habib. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have RefShare pro uh, program uh, and we can add value to your product offering to customers. So we collaborate with cyber security companies, with lawyers, uh, with UIC companies. So with all companies also providing services and products to fintechs. Uh, then uh, we'll have our meetup, so official opening of our office. We are based uh, in Viborg, in, in, in Stravinsky Lab, so it will be in two weeks in Amsterdam, so I also will come, and our Canadian director also will come, so we'll make, I think, maybe a couple of 10 minute presentations and then arrange wine tasting uh, with cheese, with snacks, so please come. Uh, let's great. Let's be so great that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well done. I'm not sure if there are any questions from the room, but I'll start in any case with one. Uh, uh, thanks, Ivan. Uh, what, what, um, so, for example, what you were saying about this uh, high risk countries where you basically try to keep two separate balances, right? In local currency and foreign currency. Uh, but if you don't exchange it, you end up with currency risk if you at least try to match it. Or is it a completely fixed ecosystem in one country and in foreign currency? Uh, just to try and understand that a little bit. So, if there's no exchange going about, basically the money you put in one account, that's the only money you can spend, or do you, can you actually make, use credit based on money you have in a different currency? Um, maybe I do the same question. So, uh, please provide an example. So, for example, so if, for example, if I would, uh, would have uh, 100, uh, let's say, if I would have 100 naira, right, and I have uh, 100 uh, euros in one account, I can only spend 100 naira, even though I also have 100 euros in my uh, other account, right? So, uh, so, so it, it depends on the no credit system between general two no credits. No no credit system. System. Yeah. It's more to basically give you an insight into all these multiple accounts to be able to manage them more thoroughly, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, what the, that's the question I have in the case. Uh, any other questions from anyone in the room? Okay. Yeah. Sure. What type of companies are you working with here in the Netherlands? Uh, well, so not just in the Netherlands, so uh, in every country, uh, most of our customers are companies uh, which launch their neo banks, e wallets, crypto fiat wallets, uh, also remittance companies. Uh, we have also some card issuers, card acquirers. So any fintech involved in payments is our potential customer, but uh, we are mostly focused on e-wallet companies uh, and uh, other companies opening payment accounts for their end users. Thank you. Yeah. Does uh, AlphaPay also have a transaction monitoring obligation in terms of anti-money laundering? And uh, well, so uh, in terms of uh, anti-money laundering functionalities, uh, we are integrated uh, with several uh, providers. Uh, KYC, uh, I'm a transaction monitor provider, so we are actively work with some substance, with Verif, with iSpiral. So, so some basic function, minor, minor functionalities we have built in our product, but uh, we encourage our customers to buy external solutions, mm -hmm. uh, so to automate this process. Okay, clear? I think let's uh, give you a big hand. Thank you very much. Uh, let us know what you thought about this presentation. <laughs> I promise you this is the last one. Oh no, we'll probably have another QR code coming up. But please let us know what the rating is. And uh, then what we're going to do is just have a little bit of fun with uh, the Kahoot quiz before we uh, all go to drinks. We have to speed up a bit because we're running slightly late. I hope everyone is done rating uh, the pay. Uh, so this will have to wait a little bit because we're first going to go to Kahoot. Here we go. Yeah.
So, if we look at the scoreboard in between the questions, Jonathan was the fastest so far. Well done. Well, we're going to get the scoreboard between all the questions, so here we go. What strategy does McKinsey propose for early stage adoption of Gen AI in banking? A decentralized approach, vertical integration, centralization, or horizontal integration? The faster you are, the more points you get, but of course, the right answer counts. Indeed, uh, centralization that they uh, proposed as a first strategy for the early adoption. Let's go to the next one. Double V is uh, doing better now, but Jonathan's following Swift with Panda, Brown, and CDD. Well done on the marketing side there. Um, which company managed to secure 4.6 billion in funding in Q1? Is that you land, I land, we land, or they land? Yes, most of you got that right, although you see that the question was a bit harder for some. Uh, indeed, it was you land who got a mix of equity and debt uh, funding and uh, secured, therefore, the largest round in our uh, funding overview. Did we still go right? Oh, we got a bit of a shake-up. Jonathan catching up again, so curious to see how that's moving up. What milestone has the cumulative trading volume of spot Bitcoin surpassed? Was that $100 million, in dollar, $5 billion, $10 million, or $15 billion invested in spot Bitcoin here? Yes, well, most of you got that right. I think it was 50 billion, quite a serious amount, sparking, of course, the Bitcoin price surge over recent uh, months. Uh, here, not much happening, so we'll continue to the next round. Which company from the Netherlands received a significant investment according to Q1 News Recap? So, which one in this list was funded? Orchestra, Data Snipper, Ascent Money, or Invest Tree? Day coming up, of course. Uh, thanks for the visuals, uh, ladies. <laughs> uh, data snipper, it was indeed. It's, uh, they provide data to, especially uh, uh, on the accounting level, uh, where increasingly uh, accounting firms need much more data to assess 
the validity of data as well as report on uh, 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 ESG, for example, as well. And that's also the kind of data they provide. Uh, so well done. Uh, any changes here? Oh, a slight move up here from double V. Well done again. It seems like a tight race. Let's see what's coming up next. Still a couple of questions to go. Which company has been instructed by the Spanish Data Protection Agency to pause operations due to privacy concerns? Was that A, Facebook, B, Google, that's not Bitcoin, or Goldcoin? Which firm got a pause to their uh, operations due to privacy concerns? Yes, you've got it right. Indeed, it was WorldGarn. Of course, a very, really nice project using crypto to uh, to actually uh, make a social project out of that, but uh, there are quite some serious concerns about the privacy within the firm. Um, Brom taking the lead for now. Well done. And let's see what's going on in the final three questions. What was the best recent year for Dutch and global fintech funding? Was that 2020, 2022, 2021, or 2023? Which year was the best? Twenty twenty one, indeed. Most of you got that right. Twenty twenty uh, was still a really good year, but twenty one really uh, marked a really big height, and twenty twenty two slightly lower, and twenty three felt like a bit of a downer after that. Um, I'm still going strong. Two questions to go. Who see, see if Brown can keep it up? Which this company hit the unicorn status in 2024? Was that Solaris, Trave, Keep It, or Moose? Of course, uh, the unicorn status means you've surpassed a, you're a private company that surpassed a one billion dollar valuation. Uh, and indeed it was Moose uh, with their uh, our property management platform. Uh, they, identify as a, they identify as a fintech uh, and they do property management and financial services around that. Um, double V going very strong, already eight straight, straight, straight right answers on the row, but Grom is keeping the lead. Let's see what the final question does. What's the date of the next Fintech Insights by Holland Fintech? <laughs> and we haven't told you yet, so this is a big one. Is it June 31st, April 12th, May 1st? The pavilion there, some side events, and we're really trying to make the most out of that massive uh, influence of Fintech that's coming to, uh, to the Netherlands. Uh, we're doing a Fintech summer school together with the UVA uh, in, uh, in early July, so before the holiday kicks in here actually there's some chance to really go deep into the fintech space with uh, and, uh, especially the impact of AI on fintech. Uh, and we've got Amsterdam Fintech Week nailed down on 2 to 4 October this year. Uh, so please note that in your agenda. Uh, we're looking forward to that, I guess, to see you at this. There's even much more events, like, for example, also the, the, the online event about uh, working in Africa that's coming up. So we haven't listed everything, but here are some of the highlights. Um, let's see. You're, uh, yeah, you got it? Um, you so can announce it then. Um, uh, yeah, so for the presentation, we have Carla as the best rated. <laughs> Yeah, hope you enjoy. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks. Well, really well done. Um, great. <coughs> I hope it's uh, just joyful. So, then indeed, as said, we really like feedback. So we and, and we like QR codes. So here we go again. Uh, so if you'd like to give us feedback, please do. If you just want to talk to us during drinks or talk to each other, that's also fine. But in any case, any suggestions, any remarks, we're really happy to receive that. Uh, thank you, team at the back, uh, Anna, Julie, Yamini, uh, well done. Thanks for all the support. And, uh, and thank you for the Well done. Thank you so much. I'm sorry? Drinks, drinks, <laughs> Yes, Julie, it's fine. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone, and look forward to seeing you later at drinks and uh, next time. Thank you.